The United States cesarean rate has increased by more than 50% over the last dozen years. What's driving these changes? How do important outcomes like neonatal mortality, perinatal mortality, and maternal mortality compare when you look at the United States in comparable countries? The rate of vaginal birth after cesareans has dropped by over 70% since 1996. What's behind these declines? I'm Gene DeClerc, Professor of Community Health Sciences at the Boston University School of Public Health, and this is Birth by the Numbers. Welcome, I'm Gene DeClerc, and I'll be your host for Birth by the Numbers 2014. This updates a, a presentation we did back in 2008, where we looked at outcomes in the United States and raised questions about that. Now, if you saw that, if you're one of the 12 people who actually saw the 2008 video, when you look at this, you'll see three different changes. One, we're doing better than we did back in 2008 on some important measures. Secondly, we're doing worse on some of the others. Third, I'm not aging very well, but that's my problem. Let's get to the numbers. 3,952,937, that represents the total number of births in the United States in 2012. The 1.29 million, that represents the number of cesarean sections in the United States in 2012. The 9.2%, that's the rate of vaginal birth after cesareans in 2012. Now the 12,104, you're gonna to have to keep watching if you wanna know what that is. So first we start with the number of total births in the United States. We've had a dramatic shift in the last few years. After a long-term increase, it dropped by 8% in the last five years. Now, the importance of that to this discussion is this. When hospitals and providers lose 8% of their customers, then there's gonna be pressure to make that up in other places. And we're still looking at how that'll sort out in the US maternity care system. I wanted to give you some good news. We've improved on the rate of prematurity in the United States. It's dropped by about 9.8% in the last half dozen years. And that's a result of a concerted effort by a large number of people in different organizations, some of which you'll see a little bit later in this video. Now this slide represents a small but important trend. Some 35,000 women in 2012 chose to give birth at home, another 15,000 or so gave birth in a birth center. What's the importance of that? These are almost all women who have given birth before and probably in a hospital. So the question this raises is, why are over 50,000 women voting with their feet to give birth outside of the setting that we're most accustomed to for maternity care in the United States. Now, the big question for this presentation is this. Is the U.S. really doing that badly in comparison to other countries? Now, you see this come out regularly. There'll be a report that comes out, and it typically says something like this. The United States, looking at something like neonatal mortality, ranks terribly. 37th among all countries. But if you look a little more closely at this chart, and that's chart, or chart, depending on where you're coming from. If you look a little bit more closely, you'll see there's a number of countries in red, and they share an important characteristic. They don't have any births to speak of. And so it's not an appropriate comparison. How small are the numbers, you say? If you added up the five countries' births in 2012, they total a number that's smaller than the number of births in South Dakota in the same year. So it's not an appropriate comparison. What would be appropriate? I use two criteria. One, that the countries have at least 100,000 births, so they have to have reasonably large systems to handle that. And secondly, that they're well-developed economically, um, using as a cutoff here $1,500 annually expended on health care. Now, if you do that, here are the countries you end up with. Let me go through each one of these cells. No, I'm not going to go through everything. Look at the list. It's an interesting list. What you find is other well-developed countries, and that's our comparison point. Now, if you think this is arbitrary, take it to the Institute of Medicine. They commissioned a study last year that looked at healthcare outcomes in the United States compared to what they called similar or comparable countries, and they pretty much have the same list as we do. Thirteen of the countries overlap. Some of the countries they had we don't include because they have less than 100,000 births. By the way, if you look at the lower right-hand corner of this slide, you'll see their presentation of the data on infant mortality puts the United States last among the countries they were using for comparison. So now that we've identified the countries we want to compare to, what do we compare on? We have several measures. Here's neonatal mortality again. Now that's deaths in the first 28 days of life over live births times 1,000. And that's good news in the sense that we're talking small numbers. When the United States has a rate of 4.0, that's four out of 1,000 babies don't live to the 28th day. 
We're also going to look at perinatal mortality. That's particularly important in cross-national comparisons because it includes fetal deaths. And in a number of countries, they rate fetal deaths slightly differently and have different classifications for live births and fetal deaths. And that causes some differences between countries just on measurement. So let's start with neonatal mortality again. Compared to those other countries, we're last. Not a good sign, and we're last by a fair amount. Now, one of the responses to this is invariably, well, you know, uh, we're a more diverse country than those other countries. Uh, we have a more complex system than those other countries. If you just looked at, say, uh, lower risk mothers, it, the comparison would do better. So let's do that. Let's limit it to white non-Hispanic mothers and see where we rank. So instead of ranking 17th, take a look at the slide, and we go all the way to 16th. We're still not doing well. And keep in mind, these comparisons are against the entire populations of other countries, many of which have very diverse populations themselves. What about perinatal mortality? We do better on that. We do a better job at limiting uh, stillbirths or fetal deaths than some other countries do. And so we go move up a little bit in the ranking. We move from last to fourth last. If we limit it to white non-Hispanic mothers, we're 10th overall. 10th is better, but it's hardly something to hang our hats on and to be particularly proud of. It's not a chant you hear in stadiums. We're number 10 is not a common chant. Now, what about maternal mortality? Maternal mortality is on a different basis. It's a ratio, and it's based on 100,000 births, because thankfully, death in childbirth is very rare. What people need to understand, if you look at the bottom of the slide, is when we measure maternal mortality, it's deaths in pregnancy as well as childbirth and out to 42 days. The comparison I'm going to show you is limited to only countries that had at least 300,000 births a year, because given the rarity of maternal death, you need larger numbers to get any kind of stability in the analysis. How do we do in that case? Second last among those countries. Um, and again, quite distinctly from all of those countries that are ahead of us on this measure. Now you say, what about if we limited it to white non-Hispanic mothers? Then instead of being second last, we become second last. And that's, again, comparing to the entire populations of these other countries. Embedded in all of this is another problem. If you look at the box in the middle of the slide, if you break down those rates by different subgroups, you find that in the case of black non-Hispanic mothers, the rate is almost three times higher than that of whites. So there's some real difficulties around this outcome. Now, are things getting better or worse? The answer is a clear, unequivocal yes. Huh? We're getting better and worse. Things are getting better in the United States, but things are getting better in the other industrialized countries as well, and they're getting better at a faster pace than we are. Let's take a look at some trends. What would be these trends? The same measures we've used. Neonatal mortality, perinatal mortality, and maternal mortality. Let's start with neonatal. Here you see the slide. It's, it's an interesting one in a couple of respects. The United States is getting better. Clearly, we've improved substantially over the last decade. But we started off with a higher rate than the average for all the other countries. And over this period of time, the other countries have improved at a faster pace than we have. So the differences between our performance and their performance has actually increased over time. Now let's put this in real terms and what it means. If we simply had the average of all the other countries, there'd be more than 6,900 fewer neonatal deaths a year in the United States. That's a huge number. How big? If you totaled that up across this period of time we're looking at now, you'd fill a stadium with all of the children whose lives were saved simply because we were average, not better, not number one, simply average with other industrialized countries. Well, what about perinatal mortality? In the earlier comparison, we did a little bit better. How do we fare over time? There's two problems here. One, we do better. We're closer to the other countries in our rate of perinatal mortality. We do have a difficulty in that the United States hasn't produced a perinatal mortality rate since 2006. In that period of time, the other countries have continued to improve. Perhaps we're improving in the United States. We can't tell because we don't have any data. What about maternal mortality? Here the data is more complex. If you look at the other countries, they've basically been flat through this period of time. If you look at the United States, we've gone up 71% over time. Now, the dotted line on the chart is important. We haven't produced a maternal mortality rate in the United States, an official one since 2007, but analysts from several different groups have, have tried to work with the data to come up with an estimate, and that's what they've estimated. 
And what it shows is a 71% increase in maternal mortality through this period of time. Now, part of this is a result of something called case ascertainment. And that simply means that we're doing a better job of identifying cases of maternal deaths than we had in the past. So some of that increase is just better measurement. But what should be kept in mind is the countries we're comparing it to are also doing a better job of case ascertainment. That's probably why their rates are staying the same through this same period of time. What about process? Biggest change in the way we do birth in the United States in recent years is represented in the next slide. I know, you're waiting. Is he ever going to get to it right now? This is the change in cesarean rates in the United States since 1989. And what you see is a small decline in the early 1990s. From 1996 through 2008, a rapid increase, and then a leveling since then. Now again, to put this in context, if we had simply kept the same cesarean rate we had back in 1996, there'd be about 480,000 fewer cesareans in the United States every year. Again, simply keeping at that average, not getting better. These rates vary by race ethnicity, and there's an intriguing trend here. When the rates were going down for white mothers and Hispanic mothers in the early 1990s, they stayed flat for black non-Hispanic mothers. When the rates started going up after 1996, they went up everywhere, to the point where now black non-Hispanic mothers are more likely to have a cesarean than white mothers or Hispanic mothers. What's also striking is if you do more elaborate analysis on this, those differences become even more pronounced than what you see here. Both black and Hispanic mothers in careful analysis have a higher likelihood of a cesarean than white non-Hispanic mothers. Now the overall cesarean rate is made up of two components. One is first time cesareans, primary cesareans, and they're represented by the red line you see on this graph. And you can see the same overall pattern of a decline in the early 90s and a rise after 1996. The blue line represents the rates of vaginal birth after cesarean. And that's the proportion of all mothers with a prior cesarean who choose to have a vaginal birth. And you can see the rapid changes in that number. As the overall rate was going down in the United States, the VBAC rate went up to 28%. At the time the overall rate starts to go up, the VBAC rate plummets. What's striking is how closely related these two trends are, given that they deal with different medical circumstances in each case. Now, the VBAC rate has started to go up slightly in the last two or three years, and we deal with that in another one of these videos a little bit later. The rate hit 9.2% in 2011, the most recent data we have available for that. That's an estimate, and it represents a slight increase, but as you can see from the slide, it's a very small increase and far below the rates we had before. Rates vary enormously by state. I'll pause for a second while you look at your state and consider how do you compare to the other states on the map. In several states, they have rates now for the state of over 36%. How do we compare to other countries? We're not the highest. Um, other countries, several other countries, Portugal, Italy included, have higher rates of cesareans than we do. And the intriguing part about this is Italy has both a high rate of cesareans and good outcomes, if you remember back to the other slides. And I'm assuming you haven't forgotten anything in any of the prior slides to this point because you will be quizzed on these later. So what does this actually mean? It suggests that there are no easy answers. Italy, for its system, manages to have a high rate of intervention and pretty good outcomes. In other countries, their rates of intervention are much lower and they have better outcomes. It's systems issues that we have to deal with here. Here's the comparison of the United States to other countries on vaginal birth after cesarean. This is not as widely reported, and we have to rely on some older data here, uh, data from 2004. But what you see is the United States is last, um, just edging out Latvia for the lowest rate of vaginal birth after cesarean among comparable countries. So if we have high rates of intervention, does it actually matter? What does it impact? We've already seen it doesn't seem to impact outcomes very much since we have improved but at slower rates than other countries with lower rates of intervention. Let's look at two different things. Yet another outcome and an examination of the economic consequences of these high rates of intervention. First, gestational age. This is the gestational age in the United States in 1990. And what you see is a peak at about 40 weeks and a slight decline on each side of that roughly approaching what we would term a normal curve. 
That's been the distribution of births by gestational age for as long as we've been recording data on gestational age. So what's different now? Here's 2012. And what you see is we've shifted it back. The peak is a clear peak now, and it's at 39 weeks. The second highest is at 37, 38 weeks, and 40 weeks is lower. When you look at this slide, you see we've shifted the gestational age in the United States back a full week, breaking a pattern that's existed as long as we've been recording data. What about costs? Now, we don't have time to get in great detail, but there's a few things you should know. First, birth accounts for the second and third leading reasons for hospitalization in the United States. Second for mothers, third for babies. Next, this issue of, well, does it cost that much more for a cesarean? Let's just look at the left side of this graph. It represents vaginal births with no complications and cesarean births with no complications. And what you see is it's about 70% more costly to do a cesarean with no complications than a vaginal birth with no complications. Now, I wouldn't argue that births with complications shouldn't be done by cesarean, but the question is, why are we doing so many and spending so much on low-risk cesareans? Let's look at the total cost of all of this to society. Now, this graph represents just hospital costs. And what you see, if you look at the upper right-hand corner, it's now reached 52,734, no, it's not that, it's billions, 52 billion, 734 million dollars. We're talking serious amounts of money in the society. And the question is, are there economies we could achieve without risking anybody's life? So, is there a problem? The answer, yeah. Is it hopeless? Absolutely not. So what can be done? There are several things we could do, but I'm gonna focus on two. Better evidence and advocacy. In terms of evidence, we have to start asking some different questions. The question is not necessarily the clinical one of, how can we do a cesarean better? We all want that to be the case. We want them done as well as possible. But maybe the question we need to consider goes all the way back to the community and asks the question, do we need to be doing as many of these as we are? In terms of advocacy, good evidence has never proven sufficient to change behavior. We need people out there taking that evidence, applying it in communities, and pressuring institutions to change. It's the only way it'll happen. Thankfully, there are a number of organizations that are doing just that right now. One is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. In March of 2014, they issued a report on safe prevention of primary cesarean deliveries. If you can reduce primary cesareans, then there's no question about a repeat cesarean and they thoughtfully explore the different avenues by which that could be done. This is Choices in Childbirth in New York City, and this is Business of Being Born, which started as a movie back in the mid 2000s and is now a website with resources for mothers. This is the Childbirth Connection, and they focus on translating evidence into practice with easy to use guides for mothers interested in learning more from the evidence that's out there in the medical literature. They also sponsor the Listening to Mothers surveys which ask mothers from around the country about their experiences in childbirth. Orgasmic Birth was a movie advocating for more positive views towards childbirth. It was also the basis for the DVD extra that became Birth by the Numbers. The group Our Bodies Ourselves has been working for decades to improve the health of mothers and their children. And this is us, Birth by the Numbers. It's a student-run website that provides additional information for faculty, students, and families who are interested in learning more about patterns of childbirth in the United States. So what have we learned? Well, things are getting better in the United States, but not fast enough. But there are a lot of groups working actively to try to make things better. We'd encourage you to join them and help all of us try to make birth safer and better in the United States. Thank you. <laughs>